Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the second interview for today. Um, welcome as well to Arc.dev's Remote Career Success Week, where we are learning how to land your dream job for those who've done it. I am your host for today. My name is Brandon Spooner. I'm the creative producer for Be Spoonified and also a friend of uh, Arc.dev, a platform connecting software developers everywhere with remote opportunities. I have the pleasure and the honor today to welcome this guest, uh, Katie Wormsley, now Katie Wild, uh, the VP of Engineering at Buffer, a globally distributed team with zero offices. And Katie joins us to chat about her experience as a champion of remote work, but also how she was able to use Twitter to get hired as an engineer. So. Mm -hmm. We are excited to have everyone join us in this conversation today. We're going to be having so many gems, so please come on into the, the live stage. Um, just to give a little bit of housekeeping real quick, uh, we will be having a Q&A session um, at the end of this uh, topic and, and conversation. So please feel free to go ahead and tag Art in the stage uh, chat with your questions. Um, we're going to be going and monitoring that throughout the entire conversation. But if there is one that you know speaks to us, we'll add it in. Uh, but we will have a full Q and A session at the end. So just hold on tight, y'all, because we have some really good information coming up. Katie, as I said earlier backstage, thank you so much for joining us today. And I am super excited to get to know you. And and I'm loving the plant background. It's giving me some <laughs> plant dad vibes right now. As <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, well, it's wonderful to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so typically, you know, during these conversations, you know, we have an opportunity that we can introduce our, our speakers. Um, but because we are in a event that is really geared toward job seeking, you know, we want to want to start it off a little bit different today. So let's, mm -hmm. you know, start off with one of those familiar job interview questions. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and oh. can you do it? as your own 30 second elevator pitch? Yeah. So disclaimer, job seekers, this question always makes me nervous. It still makes me nervous. Even when the lovely people tell me ahead of time they're gonna ask this, because it's, it's, it's hard to pitch yourself. So what I'd recommend is you practice it and you just, you, you, you get used to it. So I'm gonna start off, act all confident and be like, yeah, sure, Brandon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I am Katie Wild. I was called Katie Wamsley. I'm currently changing my name. And um, I'm currently VP Engineering of Buffer. We're a team in about 21 countries. We're just under 100 people. We're totally remote. Um, we've always been this way. Uh, company's 10 years old now. We've been remote from day one. Um, very interesting to be able to help everybody during this pandemic. I am a champion of remote work in general. I've written um, a book on the topic, The Holloway Guide to Remote Work. If you go to holloway.com, you can find that. Um, and I also really, really enjoy um, helping engineering teams and software engineers specifically to flourish, to achieve their full human potential, ideally at the company I'm working for. But if the journey takes us beyond that, I believe in that too. I've also written a couple of technical books. Um, if you go to my Twitter, that's at Katie underscore Wamas. Realize it's a little tricky. Um, you'll be able to find that as well. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you about hiring. I have a lot of the experiences as a job seeker myself. And also I do a lot of hiring. It's my day job. So I, I get to see literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applicants. So um, this is great. And there's so, so much that I can share to make this process easier for you that I'm excited to do. Katie, thank you so much for that explanation. And I know that these mm -hmm. people, uh, individuals and the attendees today are hungry for information. So let's just dive Good. right in. Um, let's, let's take it back a little bit. So before we kind of mm. talk about the job seeking process, you know, let's really know a little bit about, you know, how you started and, and why did you yeah. decide to pursue a remote engineering career? And then also to maybe uh, mm. it'd be great to understand some of the factors that help you make that decision as well. Mm. Well, um, I am a immigrant from South Africa, and um, for me, a remote a remote engineering career was my only opportunity to work for a sort of top tier U.S. based startup that was going to be, in my view, um, going places and doing things. I realize that there's a lot happening in every single country, so this is not to say that the, the U.S. is better. 
But if you're coming from another part of the world, it's not so much this like highly strategic decision to be remote. It's like, I want to get a job that pays in US dollars and that's really interesting work. And I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. How am I going to do that? What am I going to do? Um, remote is a wonderful opportunity for that because you're not just stuck to, well, who's hiring people in Cape Town, South Africa. So that was really my background and um, where I came from with remote. It was one of the ways that I, as somebody from um, not the US and as somebody from a non-traditional background, I'm a self-taught software engineer. I studied philosophy and economics. Um, so being a non-traditional candidate in many ways, the remote arena was the way I could break in. And companies, remote's a lot more common these days, um, but certainly back then, companies that were remote also tended to be a little bit less traditional. They weren't requiring me to have a CS degree um, or requiring, you know, five years of experience at some kind of company that I was never going to get access to, like Google. You know, it's not that no South Africans ever work for Google. Actually, I'm sure a lot of them do. But it's a lot harder if you're coming from, you know, Africa or wherever you're coming from. So that's and that's why I like remote. That's why I'm passionate about remote work, because I think that it opens up these interesting jobs to interesting people from all around the world. And it doesn't matter so much what country you were born into. It's more about, well, what are you interested in? What are your skills? Um, and I love that about remote work. And thank you so much for the answer. And it's amazing to, yeah. you know, look at that because we can even transition into the topic of remote work is is opening up uh, venues of accessibility that were not there before, you know, with the oh, yeah. change in um, now people are using internet more often and higher speeds. And now the accessibility for Zoom meetings where people can mm. be in different locations and still be able to communicate effectively. Remote work has been, you know, the forefront of, of the change in the kind of people's career path. You maybe you would say right i would think so yeah and it's just become a lot more mainstream and one of the one of the silver linings of this pandemic is it's forced previous naysayers to actually try it out and mm. i mean some people are like this is horrendous <laughs> you know i hate it <laughs> and that's a valid learning too i want to emphasize remote works not for anyone and that's cool um but it does mean that lots more companies have realized it's a lot more doable than they might have thought it was yeah. And, yeah. and then, you know, as you said earlier, too, you know, when we're, we're thinking about like landing that job, right, looking at, yeah. you know, looking into the search of finding remote work and opportunities, you know, you said earlier mm -hmm. that you come from a non-traditional background, you're a self-taught mm -hmm. developer. And so how would you describe your journey breaking into the tech world coming from that non-traditional space, you know, and now being the VP of engineering where you're surrounded by developers and engineers and, and, mm. and, and, and in that kind of position? Yeah, I would say it's pretty, it was pretty scary. I definitely found, um, I found learning to code extremely challenging and it felt like I hit my head against a brick wall, not understanding anything for about a year. And then suddenly it was like overnight I'd learned to code. I was like, huh, yeah, that makes sense. I can do this now. Um, so if anybody in the audience is, I see there's someone in the chat transitioning into front end development. Like it's normal for this to be very difficult for a fairly long time. Don't panic. Don't give up. That's totally normal. Um, and um, you asked me, you know, breaking into that environment. What was that? What was that like? I do want to tell the audience that more than half of all the developers surveyed in the Stack Overflow developer survey are actually self-taught. So when we say non-traditional, we're actually in the majority. More people are non-traditional than traditional um so fun fact i found that gave me a lot of confidence and i realized like actually it's not really weird to be self-taught i had a lot of imposter syndrome are people going to really believe i'm an engineer you know so there's some of the classic um i don't look like the dude from mr robot so maybe they won't think i'm actually an engineer like i can't you know hit them over the head with my degree to like prove it like is anyone going to take me seriously I lost a lot of energy to that. So the advice I would have is try not to overthink it too much. Keep going, keep pushing forward, put yourself out there, apply for jobs, apply for things that you're not 100% qualified for. When I applied for my dream job at Buffer, in my mind, this was my first of many applications to this company. I was like, this is my test run application. I'm never gonna get this job. Maybe I can get an interview. And if I can get an interview, I can get feedback. 
And that's my goal. And I got the job. I mean, I still, I feel like I still sometimes can't believe it. I'm, you know, was there a mistake? Um, but just keep going. And it's okay if you feel scared, if you feel like you have imposter syndrome, if you feel like maybe you shouldn't belong here. That's not true. You absolutely belong in tech. Tech is a lot more diverse than people think it is, than people's narrow ideas. Um, if you're untraditional, most people are untraditional. Um, so yeah, it's completely normal and it's okay. And you can hit me up on Twitter if you feel particularly worried about anything. Everyone, it's okay. We just it's want okay. to send that message out <laughs> You will be <today>. okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tweet, guys. That's a tweet. It's okay. Yeah. We're going to use that today. And thank you for acknowledging yeah. that because, uh, you know, now is the time where, you know, things have shifted majorly within, you know, yeah. how we operate day to day, as you said. And now we're seeing a lot of people changing careers. And so that's just great to know that, you know, at the end of the day, it's really understanding your passion and what you have inside of you and what you really want to move forward with when you're thinking of the traditional path mm -hmm. compared to the non-traditional path when everybody is, there is no path really. It's just kind of your journey. Yeah. Um, and then kind of going into that question too, Katie, you know, you were talking about earlier, you know, looking at, mm -hmm. you know, different job opportunities and job perspectives when you're looking at job boards and things online. Is there mm -hmm. anything and tips that you should give to some of these people that are in the process of looking for jobs now um, that when they're yeah. reading the job descriptions to, hey, this is something that to be aware of or this is something to highlight. And these are a few things that if you don't have, maybe you can, you know, use some other experience yeah. to make yourself more relevant to the, this opportunity right now. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing I would say is if you read a job description and you're going through the bullet points and you're like, yep, 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 yep. I meet all of these. Great. You're applying for the wrong job. You are massively, massively overqualified. You should only ever meet about 70% of the criteria. Please write this down. It's not a good thing. If you're meeting 100% of the criteria, you should be applying for your boss's job. Okay. Um, so make sure that when you're applying for jobs, you're going for jobs where you're meeting about 70%. If you're meeting, you know, 30%, I once had somebody apply to be a, a software um, development manager, an engineering manager, and um, the applicant said, well, it, it never worked in software at all, and um, actually doesn't know anything about computers, um, is a creative film director, um, but is pretty good with like the Wi-Fi. So that is not meeting enough of the job description at all um, to lead a team. So not not like none of it, but um, you want to go through and you want to make sure that you're you're maybe meeting about seventy percent. I would say that's your sweet spot where you're you're absolutely qualified, but this is going to be a job that's a good job for you. It's a bit of a stretch. It's going to take you forward. Um, a job where you're meeting hundred percent criteria, you're just overqualified for it. Criteria that are more negotiable versus more um, nice to have. So look for companies that split those things out. A lot of companies will say these are the requirements and these are optionable, nice to have, preferred but not required. Companies that actually split that out, it's a good signal for the culture of the company. So that's like you want to see that. You want to see the hiring manager have an awareness of what are the things that you absolutely need to do this job, like front end dev. JavaScript, it is required. If you don't know JavaScript, you can't do the job at all. I for design, well, that's a nice to have. And you want the hiring manager to actually say, you definitely need to know JavaScript. If you have an eye for design and you know how to make things look pretty, that would be a great bonus for us, but you don't have to be like a designer as well. Um, if it's not split out what's required versus what's nice to have, try to suss it out based on the job title. So if the job title is something like full stack engineer, you know that they're going to want some kind of back-end work and some kind of front-end work, and that bit's going to be required. If they're saying things like really good at project managing, that's not strictly what a back-end dev is. So you can kind of infer that that's maybe a little bit more of a nice to have. Or if they're saying you have experience being on call and debugging live production issues, Again, that is not actually core to the meaning of a back-end developer. So I would put that in the nice-to-have column. And if you're not really sure, just apply anyway. That's almost my rule. Um, you're going to get a little bit more information um, by applying for jobs and getting interviews and then understanding if you don't move forward, what is it about you as a candidate that caused you not to move forward? What is it about the skill set? And use the job hunt not as a, oh, my God, I've got to get a job, 
but use it as a way of a process of self-discovery to understand where am I standing out as a candidate, where are um, perhaps the skill sets or where am I not interviewing well that I can improve. And if you go into every interview with this idea of like, not, oh my God, it's a job interview. I've got a crush because I need this job. Go in as like, it's just an interview. And my goal is to get feedback. My goal is to understand more about myself and more about my job search. It's going to relax you. Everything's better when you're relaxed and you're going to start getting meaningful feedback. Um, if you're having the experience where you're applying to lots and lots of jobs and you're not getting any interviews at all, I've had this experience. I know exactly what that's like. Doesn't mean you won't one day be VP of engineering because here I am. So again, you're not a failure if this is happening to you. Um, but it does mean that you're doing something wrong. I don't know what, but the most common mistake people are making when they're in this situation is you're applying for lots and lots and lots of volume and you're doing a standard application. You're giving in the same cover letter to everyone. You're, you know, giving the same resume to everyone. Don't do that. You want to be a little more tailored. So you want to say, hi, Katie, what I love about Buffer, insert company name, is insert company values. And I want to contribute to insert company mission in insert specific way, right? So you want to tailor it because that hiring manager knows that you want a job. They don't actually care. What they want to see is they want a job with me. They want this job. They want my job. So you need to be a little bit more personal to stand out. So that's the most common mistake if you're having the experience where you're firing off tons and tons and tons of applications and you're not getting any interviews at all. You're probably just sending out too many standardized applications and you want to customize them. The other thing is you should customize your resume for each job. You should be like, okay, they're looking for a backend engineer and they want somebody that is going to debug live production issues. Is there any way I can reflect that in my resume? Is there even that one time when something went wrong and I wasn't actually the on-call person, but I managed to help and try to bring that out in the resume, right? So you want to edit your resume. You don't have to do it from scratch, but you want to edit your resume for every job description to essentially pattern match. Like this person is very busy. They've got 30 seconds per resume and they're looking for buzzwords. They got the job description up on one screen. They're going for resumes really fast and they're just pattern mashing. So do yourself a favor and just put the buzzwords in the resume as much as you can. And Katie, you, you, <laughs> the tweets are going crazy right now. The tweets are going crazy. <laughs> um, and th that is so such valuable information. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the number one, the percentages of the 70% and then also to translating into just making yourself unique and stand out. And mm -hmm. so let's kind of walk through that that process and that journey again. So we've we've went through, we've customized our resume, we've really used the buzzwords, we we've, we've taken you know um, each job description and made it unique um, to the job itself, and also to taking those characteristics characteristics and experiences within our own career development and applied it that is applicable for the job. And we have an interview. So now that we have an interview and then the preparation for that interview, what are some of the interview questions that you typically ask during this interview process? And also too, would you be open to sharing maybe one of your personal favorite questions and answers that you've gotten from interviewees? Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay. So, um, uh, an interview question that I really love to ask is tell me what a productive day at work looks like to you. And there's a way to give me the right answer. And the key is the job description, read the job description and say things that match the job description. Because if someone is like, Ooh, for me, a great day at work is, and they go on about something completely irrelevant. What I hear is you're qualified to do the job, but you don't want to do it. And I'm not going to hire someone that I know doesn't actually want to do the thing we need you to do. So I always ask that and it sounds like a, it's a soft opener. It's a little bit of a tell me about yourself question. Um, but tell me what is a productive day. Make sure that you're answering the elements of the job description. If it's a front end dev role, make sure that your answer involves like actually writing code. So um, <laughs> it sounds really obvious, but like once somebody, it's like, this is a developer job. We want you to want to code, right? So I always ask that one. Um, I also like to ask, what do you think makes for a good job title? So what do you think makes for a good software dev? And I am actually in this question, I'm looking for a growth mindset. I'm looking for somebody to say something like, 
somebody that is curious, somebody that is open to learning. The best answers I've ever gotten are around this kind of approach. It's like, well, I think what makes for a good ex is somebody that is genuinely interested in continuously bettering themselves, working with other people. And honestly, you can probably answer that for, for, for any job. What do you think makes for you know a good CEO? Well, they, they're curious about constantly getting better and taking feedback. And that sounds legit to me. Um, the worst answers I've ever gotten um, is something like, oh, well, you either have it or you don't, or it's some kind of coding gene or a very sort of like rigid, fixed mindset, um, judgy answer, because I don't want you to judge your teammates. I want you to be like a pleasant person who's going to get along with the other engineers that I feel protective of because they're my team and you're the new one. So you want to give an answer that is, uh, <laughs> it seems like you're a nice person, right? Um, and then um, I have a lot of questions that I will ask sort of to assess um, skill set and where how you're thinking about things. So I'm going to put them in the take home pack that everybody's going to get to take home um, of the questions because there's just too many to go into there. Um, but another one that I always ask for is tell me about a time when you were really frustrated at work. And this is the one that people are often not prepared for because it's a bit of a, you don't want to speak ill of a previous employee or you don't want to come off as somebody who's easily frustrated, but you have to give some kind of answer. So my advice on that is just prepare that one a little bit ahead of time. It's like when somebody asks you, what's your biggest weakness? And then you go, perfectionism. No, you don't go perfectionism. That's actually really bad to be a perfectionist. <laughs> Perfectionists don't get anything done. <laughs> but um, you know, a time you were frustrated about work. The other question is, tell me about a time you failed. And now it's like, that's hard to answer on the spot because, you know, you, you want to be vulnerable and honest, but you also, you want to give a, a good failure, you know, not like a completely horrendous story. So um, my advice on these ones, like tell me about a frustration, tell me about a time you failed is look for something true. Look for a time when you, you actually were genuinely really, really upset, really frustrated. Um, or a time when like you, you really messed up, you know, it's like you, you absolutely failed. Don't go for something that's like, oh, well, the frustration was, but actually it was perfect. Or the humble brag, you know, like, oh, well, the time I failed was this project. It was too successful. Um, and then my boss looked bad. And then I, I guess I failed because I showed. So no humble brag, no fake problem, no frustration. That's not actually a true frustration because we want to show vulnerability. We want to show learning from the experience. So be honest and vulnerable, but always take responsibility and show that you've learned. We want to see, as the hiring manager, we want to see what is called a internal locus of control. You should write that down and Google it. It means that I, the candidate, believe that I have some kind of control over my destiny, over my environment. I'm the kind of person who takes responsibility and sees myself as an agent, as a participant. I'm not this kind of, you know, just going to sit back and, Oh, yeah, it's frustrating time at work when everyone around me, I was just surrounded by assholes. Oh, poor me, you know. And the time when I failed, well, it really wasn't my fault. Like, oh, this thing happened. But I mean, it's sure, they should have, you know. Da, 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 da. That shows me that you're always going to be a little bit of a victim, right? You're always, you're not going to learn. You're not going to take responsibility. You're not going to be a good team player. You're going to kind of look for the excuse all the time. Um, and that's why people ask questions like, tell me what is your biggest weakness? Tell me about a time you fail. Tell me about um, something that was frustrating for you because they want to see vulnerability. They want to see honesty. They want to also see growth, learning, and an internal locus of control. And we just went ahead and posted uh, a link to that in the chat, everyone. So if oh, you're looking great. for it, Feel free to access that. Katie, this is so much, there's so many gems here that you're dropping. So I'm hoping everybody <laughs> has a shovel and their bag ready to collect them in. Um, but let's also too, you know, we were talking about your tips, right? You know, you're mm -hmm. looking at things of honesty and vulnerability, you know, yeah. looking at the internal locus of control. You know, what's a number one non-obvious tip that you haven't already mentioned for, you know, those remote job engineering uh, seekers, you know, to so put in the forefront? Yeah, uh, communication skills. It's a remote job. Like, you're going to have to 
communicate with people. Um, and often in, in tech and engineering, it's something that people don't know that they should emphasize. So make sure that your written information, your written communication is really clear. Don't respond to an email with something like, sure. Respond to the email with like, thanks, Braden. I will see you at 1030 in time zone. Time zones are not obvious. Very clear, very specific written communication. Because throughout the hiring process, all those non-interview things, scheduling the interview, asking a follow-up, any kind of, hey, um, here's the Zoom link, respond. Thanks so much. I've got it. You know, you want to make sure that you're communicating to the hiring managers that you can communicate. You're responsive. You're proactive. Um, you should also be quick on the uptake. If they send you an email that's like, hey, we'd love to interview. We got your application. We loved it. Please schedule an interview using this link. Do it right away. Don't wait because they want to see quick on the uptake. Um, and then also reply to the email and be like, that's great. Got it. I've scheduled the time for time in time zone. See you then. Thanks. So that, that I would say is a, um, for remote especially, it's something that they're going to assume is very good. And if you drop the ball on that, like a remote team probably just won't hire you because it's really hard to picture working with someone in a remote setting. If it's a, if it's a hassle to even organize the interview, they're just going to be like, you know what, forget it. Like, I don't want to do a project with you. I can't even figure out if you're going to rock up to the interview or not yet. So, yeah. It, it, <laughs> so tapping into clear, concise communication as, as a mm. non, non, but pretty much non-obvious, it has to be there. Um, would you, you know, maybe go in a little bit more detail of some other mm. three key soft skills that you as a manager are looking for potential, um, you know, uh, people, engineers that you're looking to hire at Buffer as well? Yeah. So the soft skills I'm looking for, I'm looking for um, that communication. That would be number one. I'm also looking for somebody that I feel is going to be able to collaborate well with people from different background, backgrounds, different cultures. In a remote team, you're going to be... I mean, you might be all remote within the US, but even then you're going to be dealing with people from all different states, at least. You're going to be dealing across time zones. So we're looking for um, emotional intelligence. We're looking for empathy. We're looking for people that don't make assumptions. They, they, they check first. Um, in that case where I'm looking for the, the collaboration skills, I'm going to be asking questions around you know teamwork and collaboration, but I'm looking for things like, um, you are empathetic to the interviewer. So interviewer sneezes, you say, bless you, you know, um, interviewer is like, oh yeah, I'm from wherever you say something nice. Oh, I've always wanted to go there. Right. Just, just a little bit, you know, you don't have to overdo it, but we're trying to see how are you going to get on with the rest of the teammates that might be really different from you. You know, you might suddenly be working with somebody from, you know, um, Singapore, somebody from Sri Lanka, um, a Brit, you know, a little bit more resistant, maybe culturally, you know, and some sort of like very excited Americans. Right. And we're looking for people that can get along with the spectrum of um, personalities in the remote world. So that's important. Um, don't ever use lingo. I see a lot of people early in their career make the mistake of thinking it sounds impressive, but it doesn't. It just sounds like you're kind of wanting to make other people feel bad or you're wanting to confuse people. Um, if you use a lot of um, acronyms, you know, um, always you can use an acronym, but then always just check with the interviewer like, oh, are you familiar? Don't make assumptions about your interviewer. Don't don't be like, well, obviously you don't know what an API is, Brandon. Like that would be very insulting. Mm -hmm. Just say, um, yeah, we're using um, the GraphQL API. Brandon, just checking, are you familiar with that? And your interviewer will then say like, actually, no, can you explain? Mm -hmm. Or they'll be like, yeah, yeah, we, I use it all the time. So we're looking for that kind of subtle awareness. If you use a term or use an acronym or use lingo, just a little check in like you familiar with that if the person goes yeah i'm really experienced with that fantastic the person says actually i i don't know what you mean by that then you just give a a small little explanation um and then the third sort of you asked me for three soft skills here brandon Correct. yeah 
Correct. And so communication, collaboration, especially, you know, don't make assumptions about people. Um, and then the third soft skill um, that I would be looking for is tone over text. So this is a big one in the remote world, but a lot of people that are lovely and pleasant and like just so personable um, will send text messages like, hi, full stop. Can you send me the link full stop? And it sounds really angry. So we're also looking for, um, can they communicate tone over text? It's, um, not obvious, but it's a very important soft skill when so much of remote communication is happening over text. And you won't believe the amount of like hurt feelings and confusion that happens because research shows that positive tone messages are perceived by the recipient as neutral and neutral text messages like, hey, can you send me the file? Are perceived as negative. So if you say to somebody, hey, can you send me the file? They're going to hear, hey, can you send me the file? You know? Um, and they'll be like, geez, okay, like, here it is, fine. Um, whereas if you say, hey, smiley face, could you send me the smile, question mark, thanks emoji, you're sending an overtly positive coded message. Your recipient doesn't hear overtly positive. The recipient goes, hi, could you send me the file? Just neutral. So in order for your language in text to land as neutral, you have to explicitly code it as positive. You have to got, use the emoji. It's not unprofessional. It's very important. Got to use the emoji. You've got to use the little like niceties, you know, like, hey, Brandon, hope you're having a great day. When you get a chance, could you send me the file? It's another way of doing it um, because it's going to get interpreted as a lot more negative than what you meant. Um, and that's one of the number one kind of hard to get the team to work together it's like well if everyone is communicating via text and they're not mindful of this tone issue which is a massive issue in the remote world um it's going to be in a pretty unpleasant team environment everyone's going to think everyone hates each other so we do look for tone over text yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and those are great skills because you know even now with people you know transitioning to more of a remote um careers that we used to be in person where you would go to your neighbor's cubicle and say hey and, yeah. and that kind of pleasantry when you're looking for a task or for a, a opportunities and or communication skills um it is lost so i think that's a really great mm. thing that you brought up but just looking at the tone and, and the context of just a simple message um and having that present moving forward when you're communicating to employers or even communicating to other colleagues. Um, yeah. Katie, one of the things that uh, stands out, um, and we've talked a little bit about this backstage, is your your journey through Twitter of how you landed your job at Buffer. So I would love to ask you, can you tell us a little bit more about you know how you use Twitter to land your job at Buffer? Mm -hmm. And then... A really fun one would be, what's your mm. secret recipe for the perfect tweet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, how I use Twitter to get a job at Buffer, I think that this is um, a very transferable skill. Obviously, Buffer is a social media company. So like the company is on Twitter. The employees are on Twitter. That obviously helps. Um, but these days, most... Um, not most. I would say a lot of tech companies, the employees are on Twitter. It's a, it's a pretty... Um, still pretty popular social network. And um, what you're doing there is you're creating your informal reputation um, and you're also creating a bit of a network within the company. So you want to do two things with your Twitter. The first one is that when people go to your Twitter profile, they want to get the idea that you can do this job or you, you are in some way a professional at whatever the job is that you're applying for. So now I'm worried about what my Twitter profile looks like. Um, <laughs> people are going to be like, hey. Um, <laughs> but um, you want to make sure that you got a profile picture. It's your face. It's not the egg. You want to have a nice background picture. You know, um, you want to have, you know, what, what is that you do? Um, and if you're an aspiring such and such, just take out the word aspiring. Just be like, I'm a front end developer. That's fine. You know, like no one on Twitter is, it, it don't lie, but no one on Twitter is there to judge you. They're trying to get a sense of like, what are you, what are you all about? And then they're going to look at your, your pinned tweet. So you should use that. You should have a tweet that is a pinned tweet. Um, my pinned tweet is something that I came up with on the elliptical and then just tweeted. And then for some reason, people on Twitter really liked it. So it got a lot of likes. So I've just pinned this random me saying, girls of wisdom which is terrible um <laughs> but uh <laughs> so if you have a tweet like that you can pin that tweet yeah. um 
the other thing you can do, which is really nice, is if you have a piece of work you're proud of, if you were, um, you know, if you contributed to something that got, you know, published, maybe you contributed to an open source project that you want to highlight, like, oh, I made my first contribution to um, Bauer today, and you've got the, the PR. That's like a, a nice little thing um, to pin as a tweet, because immediately people are going to say, oh, so so and so and their front end dev and wow they contributed to open source like so already they're viewing you in a certain light they're viewing you as a professional software engineer and then when you're tweeting you want to have a mix of informational tweets where you're sharing articles um you're sharing things you've learned thoughts and your normal kind of more social tweets or retweets or whatever that's fine it's fine to show personality on twitter absolutely fine to like retweet cat videos or whatever um but you want to get a mix in there of like cat videos and maybe um here's how i like to think of managing state in front end applications um something that i see people not make enough use of is um tweeting articles that they've read that might have been interesting to them or new information to them because they think everyone else already knows it so a people don't actually know all of the things you know um and b maybe they do know it but they need to know that you know it if that makes sense so that's the first avenue of twitter using it to build your your informal reputation this is that when we look at your twitter um when we look at the number of followers you have when we look at what you're tweeting it's sort of professional you're tweeting about the topic that you're looking for a job um the area where you're looking for a job the second thing is using twitter for networking now, um, this is a very high effort approach, so you can't realistically do it for every company. But if you have a dream job or you have a couple companies where you'd really, really like to work at that company, follow the company and as many people from that company that you can find on Twitter. And then find ways to at mention them and engage with their content. So one way of doing this is you can turn on tweet notifications for these people. And then whenever they tweet something, you can press heart and then you can reply. This is great. This is lovely. This is why people tweet. Everybody wants to be engaged with. So you see uh, Joel from Buffer tweeted something about, you know, we're um, buying back our investors and great news. And then you're going to hop the tweet and you're going to be like, wow, I love that approach. It's really inspiring. I love what you've done. Um, this is similar to what Wistia did over here, um, you know, and that is going to make you get a little bit noticed. And now you need to do that a lot of times. One of the um, other strategies I've used is find when people from the company um, that you're interested in applying, find when they're doing talks or podcasts and then actually tweet little quotes from them. So if somebody wanted to work for me and was in the audience, what I would do right now is I would be tweeting things I'm saying with the at Katie little tag, and then I'd be tweeting them. And the impact is that by the time I'm finished the talk, if you do this, I will get like 50 notifications from you, from this one person. So like, I'm gonna remember like, who is Yvonne Smith, right? I'm gonna be like, oh yeah, the person that tweeted at me 50 times, right? Um, so that's something that I've done quite a lot and it gets people to follow you back because you sort of break through the, the noise and it's not spammy because you're, you're quoting them on a lot of things that they're saying and you're helping them share their message more widely. It's something that they care about. That's why they're there telling you the thing. Um, so those would be my two top tips for networking over Twitter. By the time I ended up joining Buffer, I knew so many of the team that it wasn't like, oh, this is a new engineer. It was like, oh yeah, do you know Katie? She's working for us now on the same team. Oh, great. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was very, very interesting. I probably I probably overdid it, to be honest, um, but rather overdo than underdo. Um, and the same thing, you know, when I became an engineering manager, you know, people were like, yeah, you know, like you've been at the company, I don't know, a couple of years. And it's like, actually, I've only been here six months, but because I'd been involved in the company for so long, um, it gave me a sense of belonging to that team for the team. Um, and I definitely think that that helped me in the, in the process. Awesome. Awesome. I think, mm -hmm. I think I'm back. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but thank you guys for, for rolling with us and, and, and moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. So 
and Katie, thank you so much for giving the the Twitter rundown because it's 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 always a it's a challenge, but yet a fun exercise to really understand the balance of mm -hmm. tweeting and retweeting and using your platform um, to educate, but also to uh, build awareness of your skill set and your um, presence that you can give to a company or into your actual career as well. Um, and mm -hmm. just to kind of maybe tag on to the point of using Twitter and using social media, you know, to building, you know, retweeting and, and building that network. You know, what role does your mm -hmm. network currently play? And then how do you approach yeah. making new connections remotely? Yeah. Um, well, my network currently plays the role of a sort of advisory group to help me do my job better and um, more sanely. My network right now is a lot of other engineering, I mean, engineers in general, engineering leaders. I know a lot of CTOs, a lot of VP of engineering. That's kind of what my network is currently. And what that does is it supports me in doing my job. And if I wanted to get a different job, maybe as a director at a bigger company, that would be the right network for networking. If I wanted to get a different VP engineering job or go for C-suite, I actually have the wrong network. Why? Because VP engineerings don't hire C-suite people. VPs hire people below them in the organization. Um, they're going to hire like directors and managers and engineers. So you want your net, you want to network up, right? You're looking to network with the people that might have the power to hire you as much as you can. Um, so right now my network looks like it's a peer support network. It's great for helping me do my current job better and get support and all the rest. Um, and that's a very valuable thing. You should definitely have a peer support network, but that is going to help you with where you're at and kind of growing in an incremental improvement way. If you're looking to get a new job, make a career transition, kind of break through to like the next level, you want to be networking with people that are um, essentially that have the, the power to make that happen for you. So you want to know if you're an engineer and you're wanting to get hired, you want to be building a network that has a lot of engineering managers, um, VP engineering of smaller companies, um, senior engineers, right? You want to network up because these are the people that are going to be able to say, oh, hey, actually we have an opening here um, to be connected. It's really, really interesting. I just see from my Twitter feed, um, the number of people that find their jobs over Twitter. Um, so who your network is does does matter a little bit. And then, Brandon, what was the second part of that question? The second part of the question is, um, how do you approach making new connections remotely? People that you just don't know, mm. you want to reach out and just, you know, a lot of people say, is, yep. what's the, um, the great message yep. that you can be able to use to introduce yourself to somebody or to grab their attention? Yeah, um, so it's it's actually very standard um, and very easy to do. Um, you want to uh, go to that person with something specific that you want their help or advice on. Why? People love to be asked for help. It's extremely flattering. Um, it, it helps that person to feel respected. It helps that person to feel um, useful and needed. So what you want to do is you want to go to that person and say, hey, um, um, I liked your work on X um, and I had a problem and this is what I was wondering. You know, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, you know, and um, maybe they'll respond. You can give them the option of like, this is my email or you can respond here or um, maybe we can have a call. So I often do that. You know, I, I'd, I'd love to get your help on whatever the thing is that the person knows about. Um, and then the other thing I do remotely is I just straight up say, hi, I'm looking for friends remotely. It's very difficult. This is a bit awkward, but like, do you want to hang out on Zoom sometime? And sometimes people are like, yeah, that sounds great. I'm also looking for friends. Pro tip, everyone's looking for friends, especially after 2020. We're all at home, kind of lonely, like pretty isolated, <laughs> like, you know, and I feel like everybody thinks that everyone else is like so busy and important and has these lovely social lives. And I found just being like, yeah, like, hey, Bonnie, I love being on the panel with you, looking for friends in the industry, want to hang out. They don't respond. It's totally cool. If they do respond, well, you maybe made a friend. So just kind of doing that. And remember everyone, this is awkward for everyone. Everyone's in the same in the same boat um and then use the the virtual events so basically if you look at the 
the audience panel, you can kind of see who's here, who's engaging. So actually all of you are able to become friends with everybody else because you can see each other's names. So you can easily just say like, hey, I saw that you attended the uh, um, Arc Dev Remote Career Success Week. Want to chat, want to hang out, you know. Um, you can all do this right now and make uh, however many friends are in the audience. And, and also too, guys, you know, um, after every chat and during the chats, um, we do have a networking feature. So you are able to meet with people for up to five minutes, connect, chat, do video. Um, and although our video may be down, we're still moving forward. So thank you guys for being with us. Um, I know everybody can hear me. So uh, we want to make sure that everybody can get all these great gems and, and jewels and, and really um, be able to learn more about working remotely and sometimes the challenges of working remotely <laughs> and everyone has challenges <laughs> everyone has challenges yes. um katie thank you for being such a, such a great spirit <laughs> through, um, and yeah. one of the, the great things that we um want to talk about too and a lot of people really don't bring up this topic is that there are good and bad days there are things that happen mm -hmm. that are happen great for you and things that just don't go very well and so this is a really great thing it's happening because this event and the video is not working well and internet. So looking yeah. at the part of, you know, when you're job seeking and when you're going through the process and, and maybe, you know, we, we, we try, we forget about the, the issue of mental health and safeguarding the mental health while looking mm. for work or in the process of interviewing and so on and so forth. So are, you know, can you share a few yeah. practices? Cause I know that you've also yes. mentioned in the book that, you know, you shared your approach to hiring, um, advice for managers and resource time management, but also personal habits that help you succeed. Yeah. Um, I would love to understand maybe some practices on how to improve mental health during the job search and also to improve it mm. um, while you're kind of going through the journey of finding a job and, and the ups and downs. Yeah. And even the topic, which a lot of people don't like to talk about is, you know, the rejection process of using mm. that to be a motivation to keep you to keep moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So the first thing I'd want to say is um, mental health is a problem for most people. So statistically, 50% of the population, that's one in two people, will experience clinical levels. That's like a psychologist is going to diagnose you with a disorder. So clinical levels of depression and or anxiety. One in two people over the course of their lifetimes will have like clinically clinical level of depression and anxiety. So um, if you're feeling pretty anxious and overwhelmed or maybe a bit down, I'm, I'm not diagnosing anyone. Um, but just so you know, that that's actually a very common human experience. Most people will feel like that at some point or other in their lives. And then the job search is an extremely vulnerable place to be. So you wanna be very compassionate with yourself and take really good care of your mental health. Um, because in our society, when you meet someone at a dinner party or whatever, you usually say, what's your name? And then how do you sell your labor? What do you do? That's not the question. Like, oh, so who are you and what do you do? And it's very difficult then um, when society places so much of your your self-worth, um, who you are, your identity onto the job you happen to do. Being in the job hunting process, it you're kind of in this awful limbo where it's not just the job, but it's your self-worth and it's your identity that is kind of getting constantly knocked and evaluated. You might ask yourself questions like, is anyone ever going to hire me or am I a useless person? No, you're not a useless person. Yes, you will get hired. Um, or, um, you know, oh, I'll never be a real ex. It's classic thought trap. And it's like, nobody's a real ex. That question doesn't make sense. Just carry on. Um, so it's important to acknowledge if you're having these negative experiences that a job search is one of the most destabilizing things that we can do. So of course it's going to be difficult. And it means that you need to have a game plan for how to take care of yourself during this process. So. If you find that you're naturally prone to anxiety and or depression has happened to you before, I really recommend that you consider seriously seeing a therapist. It's very helpful and they can give you the professional level of support you need. If you generally have pretty fine mental health, you don't often struggle with this and you're going through a job hunt. It's also 2020, which has been quite bad. Um, you want to take really good care of your mental health and have good mental hygiene because you don't want to develop a, to labor this metaphor, you don't want to develop an infection. Um, and what that means is um, 
you know, you, you need to exercise pretty much every day. So why is that? Well, it gives you the brain chemicals that you're going to need to stay off anxiety and depression, and it helps you complete what is called the stress response cycle. So evolutionarily, when we would get stressed, you're pursued by a lion. So what do you do? Well, you run away and then you run back to, you know, your little band of hunter gatherers and they're like, you made it great. And they give you hugs. And that tells your brain that everything's okay. We don't have that in the modern world. We just have this like rising, rising stress on computers. And you need to tell your body that like, actually it's okay. You're not in an existential threat situation. Best way you can do that is literally exercise for 20 to 30 minutes every day. Very important. Um, if you're able to, you know, if you live at home with other people that you can um, have social contact with, getting a hug is also a really good thing that will help your body learn that you're safe. We know mentally that we're safe, but often when we're having a stressful experience like a job hunt, your body doesn't get the memo. Your body does not understand that it's just a rejection email. It's not, in fact, a lion. And your, your whole nervous system reacts like you're being chased by a lion. So what you have to do is... Make sure that you give your body the message that it is safe by running away from the lion and you can just run down the road and back, right? And then it's like, okay, cool, we made it, we're fine. So exercise is really important. The other thing that there's a lot of research around is mindfulness and meditation. Um, so I am a big fan of this, but I struggle to do it consistently. And every time I talk about this, I'm like, I got to get back with the headspace. Um, so I use the app called Headspace and meditation is extremely helpful to slow down your inner critic that is telling you all kinds of nasty things and to be more in the moment, in this exact moment. And for most of us, most of the time, the exact moment we're in is perfectly fine. Like there's nothing existentially wrong, you know, and you can run through, you know, am I in physical danger? No. Am I hungry or thirsty? If yes, you can eat something, drink something. If not, no. Is there anything else that's actually wrong with me that I'm in some way unsafe or not okay? No. Okay, well, then these are just thoughts and feelings. They're not reality and they will pass. And meditation helps you to develop a healthy detachment from your thoughts and feelings so you don't think that they are reality. There's a difference between thinking, oh, maybe I'll never get a job and like actually thinking that's your reality. It's not your reality. So you don't want to believe your own inner critic. And mindfulness meditation helps you to do that. Um, the other one that's really helpful for mental health, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, is um, get some kind of light box and get a bit of um, light on your face for 20 to 30 minutes. It'll help you fight off seasonal affective disorder. Nice. I have a little light box right there. So I sit on that chair. So this is my actual morning routine. So I sit on the chair, I have the light box, I drink my coffee. It's extremely bright and a little bit challenging, to be honest. Um, but it helps to fight off seasonal affective disorder. And um, that's the thing where, you know, you're moody and blue and anxious because it's the winter, which is just a normal human thing. Um, so that's really helpful if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and then the last um, scientifically proven way to improve your mental health is gratitude journaling. There's a huge amount of research that if you take the time every day to write down three things that you're grateful for that day, um, it helps you to rewire your brain to see the world in a more positive and a more optimistic way. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're going through the job hunt, which is going to naturally make you see the world as a more hostile, scary place because you're being evaluated and that's scary writing down things that you're grateful for every day, um, it, it actually, I'm not making this up, like there's a ton of research that like, it actually re reprograms your brain um, to be in a more positive state. So you, and they can be very small things. It's like, I'm really grateful that I um, had delicious coffee this morning. I was also able to get a pastry and that was really tasty. Um, and I'm really grateful for my cute Ikea lights that are cozy. And like, I'm already feeling like a little bit better, right? So if you build that habit over time of gratitude journaling, it helps a lot with your mental health. Um, and then last year, like seriously consider professional support. Like I do all of these things and I see a therapist once a week and I'm very grateful to him. He helps a lot. Also, medication is fine. I, if you don't make enough serotonin, store-bought is okay. See your GP if you have a problem. 
<laughs> Thank you, Kate. And it's one thing that yeah. we are grateful for <laughs> is to have you and 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 uh, to share you share your story with us. So thank you so much. Um, we're at the point right now where we have gone through all of our questions, and we want to transition over to the Q and A portion mm-hmm. of this chat today. And so I'm going to walk through. And first of all, guys, please go ahead and add the questions that you have for Katie um, into the chat. Katie, is it okay if we go a little bit over time today? I know. Oh, uh, I'm fine. We're right at it. Yeah. So, guys, we'll go a little bit over time due to some of the technical difficulties that happen to give you guys more time to ask questions. Um, but the first question they have here comes from Tina. And Tina said that she's also applied for work for Buffer. Um, and she wants to know, do you have any tips to get your applications recognized, especially in future product roles? Um, absolutely. So um, put a lot of care into answering any questions on the application form and really personalizing your application to that team, that product, um, whatever it is that you're going to be doing. Um, I also need to tell you that for Buffer Rolls, we, we have genuinely hundreds of applicants. So it's, it's no reflection on you if you didn't end up getting an interview. I think it's because we're one of the more well-known remote companies, um, but it, it is competitive. So... Um, don't feel bad. And a lot of people on the team have applied multiple times. One person applied like seven times and he's now on the team and he's great. So, you know, don't be demoralized. Keep trying, keep trying. Yeah, keep, keep, keep trying, keep going. <laughs> Another yeah. question we have today is from Mika. Mika asks, often okay. I can't uh, get meaningful feedback to our conversation earlier about getting feedback yeah. from your interviewee, interviewer. Um, how can I make interviewers feel more comfortable sharing that feedback with me? Um, yes. So a lot of times they don't want to give you feedback because they're very, very worried that you're going to sue them. So um, they almost like, you know, they're going to say something super vague, like you were fantastic and perfect in every way. However, we decided to go with another candidate. And it's like, well, that was perfect. You're in. Um, so that's a common problem. And a lot of interviewers are going to be hesitant to give you constructive feedback. Um, what you can do is say, um, is there anything that I haven't addressed that you might want to know more about? And that's a way for them to kind of point you in the right direction without saying, this is why we're not hiring you. Um, so that's, if, is there anything I haven't addressed is like one way to make it legally safer for the interviewer. Because if you say, give me some feedback on why you didn't hire me it sounds like you're asking, tell me why you didn't hire me. And if the person tells you, then maybe you're going to like sue them for job discrimination, which is their biggest fear. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that I could have addressed? Is there Mm -hmm. anything that I could have shared more about? Um, Do you have any tips for me for, for future interviews? I'd be really, really grateful for the candid feedback. I find it hard to get feedback. That's also, um, it's a bit of a play to the emotions, but you're trying to reassure them that I'm not trying to, I'm not going to sue you. Um, I actually just really want to learn. Um, So you can actually just add that in and ask that as well. And then a really good follow-up question um, to that is, you know, looking at the trend of American companies to hire candidates with a green card and HIV visas, Mm -hmm. um, any advice that you can provide to get through this hurdle? (laughs) Go to Canada. I'm not joking. Oh, Oh, okay. (laughs) The U.S. immigration system, um, so the problem is um, it's very, very difficult for companies to sponsor green cards. I think it's almost impossible. And because of the H-1B lottery cap, um, even if the company sponsors you for an H-1B and um, they submit that application, there's only a 25% chance that you're going to get the visa. That's even if you qualified and they qualify and they sponsor you because they're only able to issue 60,000 visas a year and there's something like 220,000 applications. So it's a numbers game. There's no way around it. Um, the U.S. does not actually make it easy for skilled immigrants to take jobs in the U.S. You know who does? Canada does. Canada is great. I am an immigrant to Canada. So are many other people, especially in the tech industry. There's a lot of jobs up here. And there's also a lot of U.S. companies that hire remote in North America, which is U.S. and Canada. So if you're actually if immigration is something that you're open to, um, I can tell you this as an immigrant who has recently investigated this. Canada is, in fact, the easiest country. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, question. sure. <laughs> uh, next question comes from Alejandra. Um, what do you think is the essential information in the CV 
And do you think it's, it's important to send a CV and a cover letter even when the application doesn't ask for it? I would always send a cover letter as well because um, it allows you to communicate a bit more information and to show that you've actually looked at the position and you're excited about it and be personal with the company. So I would. Um, mm -hmm. In a CV, um, we want to see just one page. Remember, the person that is looking at your CV will give you no more than 30 seconds. And 30 seconds is the maximum time frame, right? So you will get up to 30 seconds of their time. A lot of people think that the person reading their CV is going to like sit down with a cup of coffee and like really settle in and consider you as a full human being, which would be lovely, but we just don't have the time. Right. So they're basically, so how you got to picture it is like the CV is going to come in and it's like, start the clock. So what do you need? You need to know skills and experience and just like list out the skills at the top, you know, because if I'm hiring a front end dev, I want to see JavaScript. Cool. Now I'm, I keep reading. You passed the first hurdle. We're five seconds in. Now I want to see the job experience. So always start with the most recent. Um, so reverse chronological order, right? Like 2019 to the present, blah, blah, blah. Then 2018 to 2019. And you don't want to give lots of mind numbing detail. You want it to be very succinct, company, job, what you as an individual did. And something I told a job seeker really re recently is you only ever do two things in a company. You either do the thing or you lead the thing. So if you're responsible for the whole project or if you were the only person working on the project, you led the project, right? Mm -hmm. If you are a team member and you're part of the effort and you did the thing, you did the thing. Right. A lot of CVs really downplay um, their accomplishments by saying something like helped out with da 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 and they're going to picture like an intern who was like purely observing and taking notes so just change that language to like what you did like i did this these are the skills this is the job title mm -hmm. um and remember like you're going to get up to 30 seconds and then you're either going to get to um yes we're going to you know read more about you or we're going to interview you or like no reject um, and that decision is typically made within the first five seconds. So most people, it's like five seconds reject, five seconds clearly qualified, five seconds reject, five seconds clearly qualified. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, has the job. And it's those cases where structuring your CV really well matters. And even in that case, if you get to 30 seconds and the person's not sure, reject. So you need it to be very, very specific, have the buzzwords, make it easy for a stressed out and tired person that has to read literally 800 resumes, make it easy for them to be like, you are qualified, you know, um, because they're, they're literally just pad matching and they've got to go fast. Got it. And then, and yeah. that also applies to when, when thinking about, um, so that is more so the human side of it, because now you hear a lot mm. of dialogue of interview uh, resumes and CVs are going through ATS software to be scanned. So can you maybe yeah. provide some tips to optimize, you know, their CV to get yeah. to that so they can get to the actual human individual? Yeah, exactly. Well, you need to make sure that you've put in the correct buzzwords, you know, so you need to list out if it's a programming job, you need to look at the job description and you need to put on the programming languages. So you need to write on there like JavaScript, you know, next JS, all of the things so you want to, you want to match the buzzwords because at this point it's just literally a machine that's going to say all the words you said in the resume are they the same words that we've got on the job description? Um, and then even more so, so it's actually quite similar for a human doing this fast and a machine. The human under pressure behaves like the machine, right? So it's pretty similar. Make sure that it's succinct. Make sure that you're listing the skills and that you're using the same, um, the same buzzwords, the same search terms. So you're listing the languages and you're calling things by the right name. So... Don't say, um, I'm an experienced and passionate technical leader with X years of experience um, supporting teams. Um, and don't say engineering manager, right? Because the software is just going to miss the fact that you've described an engineering manager, but you didn't say engineering manager. <laughs> so don't make that mistake. <laughs> like Keep it simple, yeah. guys. Keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> you can describe it below, like quickly, but yeah, like, don't miss that. <laughs> Put it there. Um, our next question. Yeah. Um, talks, how often do you spend time to try and catch up with your team and create the great remote team environment? And what do you feel yeah. is enough time? Yeah, never enough time. So um, I can tell you how much time I spend. So I do um, 
So my direct reports, which is the people that are, I'm their direct manager. So these are engineering managers. I have um, an hour a week, every week, which is one-to-one -one time. And I also have a sort of weekly staff meeting, which is us and the whole group. Um, and then I also have regular chats with people that report to those managers, which is half an hour every six weeks. So this is everyone in engineering I'm talking to for about half an hour every six weeks. This is on the high side, um, but with remote, you don't have the kind of more casual touch points. So if you don't specifically check in and have chats with people, they could easily have worked their entire career at Buffer and like never have actually spoken to the VP of engineering, um, which would never happen in an office. Like it was just, this is not possible. Like, may, well, maybe if it's like a thousand person office, but like in a company of a hundred people, like, no, you're going to, you're going to run into that person on your first week. And it's like, oh, hey, I'm the new engineer. Oh, hi. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. So um, in a remote thing, you actually have to put it on the calendar and do that. Um, yeah. So that's the amount of time I check in with the, with the, the team. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, another question, and then and, and guys, thank you for putting in the questions. And um, are side projects in not so popular frameworks like, uh, um, excuse me, I may brutal the name, slut JS, <laughs> spelt JS, uh, good <laughs> to apply for jobs that need popular frameworks um, like React? So I would say they're going to look for frameworks and then it's like well if you've if you've done react specifically that's going to pattern match the the buzzword so it sounds like this person you already have experience in svelte js and you're like what do i do with that well definitely put it because we're looking for do you know how to work with front end frameworks do you know how a framework works right um and then it's like well do you know the specific framework um if you're considering what's the best framework for me to learn to put on a resume that's going to give me the most sort of broad based support well then choose a popular one um yeah so did i answer the question i think you did yeah okay cool <laughs> um and i think that is all of the questions that we have from the okay. audience today um thank you guys for attending uh, this section and thank you so much Katie for joining us and giving us so many great tips and and find about finding our next job in a remote space um, if you're an engineer looking for remote opportunities feel free to check out our website uh, arc.dev um, we also have started a platform for junior and internships on arc.dev as well um, as blog information awesome. so if you're looking for that information feel free to tap into that website too um, what we're going to do now is, guys, we're going to transition, take a short break. Uh, please feel free to visit our, our expo to learn more about Arc.dev or tap in into the tap in into the networking room to speed network and video chat with other attendees. Uh, Katie, before you go, can you describe this experience or maybe give us a tweet on one of the things that you really want these, um, these folks that are attending now as a takeaway? And but do it in tweet form if we can kind of maybe spice it up a little bit. Okay, the one, the, the single one takeaway from this job in tweet mm -hmm. form. Yes. Uh, from, this, from this interview in tweet form. Um, okay. Um, um, I would say the secret to job hunting is be thorough, be personal, and don't take anything personally. I like that one. I like Thank that. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some uh, heart in. I do a lot of thankful emojis. <laughs> 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 Katie, it has been such a pleasure um, uh -huh. chatting with you today. Coming up at 1.30 um, and, and actually about a, few, a couple, um, we're going to have Alistair Simpson, the VP of Design and Dropbox, is going to be joining us here on the stage to discuss how to land a job with a design degree. Um, stay tuned, guys. We're going to have more information and great chats coming up. And hopefully you enjoy the rest of the summit. Great. Thank you so much. This is lovely.